In this lesson, we're going to be exploring some changes as they relate to Cypher Suites. There are six changes that we're going to go through, and for each of them, I'm going to try and give you some context as to how it worked before, why that maybe wasn't the best choice, and how TLS.3 changes it going forward. Since all of these changes relate to Cypher Suites, I do want to start by talking about a Cypher Suite. Back in Module 5 of the Practical TLS course, we identified a Cypher Suite as a choosing of a specific protocol for each of these four security services. We also defined a bunch of the individual protocols you might find underneath key exchanges, and then a bunch of individual protocols you might find underneath authentication and encryption and hashing as well. All of that we covered in module five. So if any of this is unfamiliar to you, I'd recommend reviewing that module. A cipher suite is simply picking one combination of protocols for each of these four services. And the first change that TLS.3 brings about as they relate to cipher suites is that TLS.3 is no longer going to support older protocols. To give you some context for that, TLS.2 was released in 2008. And in 2008, TLS.2 decided to support TripleDes. TripleDes is a symmetric encryption protocol that was created in 1978. And in 2008, when TLS.2 was released, TripleDes was already under question as to how secure it actually is. Moreover, in 2006, TLS 1.1 was released, and TLS 1.1 included support for DES, which was created in 1972. In 2006, DES was already known to be completely insecure. But for the sake of backwards compatibility, TLS 1.1 included support for DES. Well, TLS 1.3 gets rid of that and says any protocol that is even mildly suspicious to be less than secure, we are no longer going to support which means this list of protocols that was supported in TLS 1.2 and prior is shrink to this. Notice any protocol which is even mildly insecure is no longer supported in TLS 1.3. Now these two over here, the PSK versions of key exchange and authentication sort of go away, but also sort of come back in a different way. So more, it's more like that they're actually just changed. We'll have dedicated lessons talking about each of those. But either way, notice there's far fewer protocols that are allowed to be used for each of these four security services. So that is the first major change to Cypher Suites in TLS 1.3. The second major change is that not only are older protocols no longer supported, but the definition of the Cypher Suite itself is also simplified. So to explain that, I want to show you a TLS 1.2 and prior Cypher Suite. This long string of characters is a TLS 1.2 and prior cipher suite. And notice in this long string of characters is a specific protocol for each of these four security services. In TLS 1.2, you had to have a specific cipher suite which accounted for every unique combination of protocols on this list, which means you had to have one cipher suite for these four protocols, another one for these four protocols, another one for these, another one for these, or these, or these, or any other protocol combination set you could choose. Since you are choosing one cipher suite to account for all four of those security services in one choice, you ended up with a list of 300 plus cipher suites in TLS 1.2 and prior, of which 270 or more were considered less than secure. What TLS 1.3 does is it simplifies the choices by breaking up the choices you use into three orthogonal choices. One choice for key exchange, another independent choice for authentication, another independent choice for encryption and hashing. A TLS 1.3 cipher suite looks like this. Notice it only specifies a symmetric encryption protocol and a hashing algorithm. Of course, you still need to do a key exchange and authentication, but those choices for what protocols you're going to use for a key exchange and authentication are done independent from the choice you use for encryption and hashing. That's what orthogonal means. The choice you use for one doesn't affect the choice you use for the others, and vice versa. The benefit to this is you no longer have to have a unique cipher suite that accounts for every unique combination of four security services. You only need a unique cipher suite for every combination of two services. Keep that in mind because that's going to come up in change number three. First, though, I want to highlight one of the other benefits you get from making these three orthogonal choices. It sort of breaks down doing security into the three core concepts of any secure communication protocol. Every secure communication protocol, so TLS, IPsec, SSH, and any others, really are just a different way of answering these three questions. Who are you? That's taken care of with authentication. 
How are we going to secure data that's going to be taken care of with symmetric encryption and hashing? And finally, how are we going to establish the mutual secret keys we need in order to do these two things? That's going to be taken care of with a key exchange. You'll notice that with TLS.3, the choice of how you're going to answer each of those are completely independent and orthogonal from each other. So that is the second change to TLS.3 as they relate to cipher suites that the cipher suite itself is simplified in that it only specifies two protocols. Which brings us to the third change. And the third change is that there are far fewer cipher suites in TLS 1.3. Remember I told you that in TLS 1.2, since a cipher suite specified a single protocol for four combinations of security services. As a result, we had to have a new cipher suite for every unique combination of four protocols. Well, in TLS 1.3, since cipher suites are simplified, we only have to have a cipher suite to account for each combination of unique symmetric encryption and hashing algorithms that are supported. And again, since far fewer of them are supported in TLS 1.3 than prior for the sake of simplicity and security, in TLS 1.3, there are only five cipher suites that exist as of the time of this recording and from the TLS 1.3 RFC. Notice how much simpler this makes our lives as TLS admins. We no longer have to look through a list of 300 ciphers to choose which ones are secure and which ones we're going to support or not. We now only have to choose from a list of five, and that's much, much easier. Plus, of this list of five, the TLS 1.3 RFC identifies which of these must be implemented, which of these should be implemented, and which of these can be implemented. The idea there is you could have a very minimalistic TLS 1.3 installation that only supports this one TLS.3 cipher. Consider things like space constrained devices or embedded systems or phones or chips that they put in smart lights or smart toasters. These are devices that would benefit from having a TLS.3 installation take up less memory. Plus it gives you a single cipher that you know every TLS.3 implementation actually supports. So that is the third change that we're gonna go through. It's that TLS.3 only includes far fewer ciphers, only five of them, than TLS.2 and prior. The fourth change we're going to step through is this one. Notice all of these ciphers are AEAD ciphers. So to unpack this, we have to first define AEAD and why that's better. So AEAD stands for Authenticated Encryption with Authenticated Data. In this context, authenticated means integrity provided. So here we're doing integrity and the encryption portion is doing confidentiality. And there are two parts to AEAD. There's the authenticated encryption part and then the authenticated data part. So with that in mind, let me show you what it was like before AEAD ciphers. Here you have a record which includes application data that is meant to be secured by TLS. This application data could be HTML content this would be something like an HTTPS exchange. But from the perspective of TLS, all of this is simply some ones and zeros that need to be protected and sent to the other side. Well, before AEAD ciphers, what TLS and SSL did is it would first hash everything over here, add the digest to the end, add some padding, and then encrypt everything below the record header. Notice, first we did hashing, and then we did encryption. It was two separate steps. That's where AEAD comes into play. That's what changes in an AEAD cipher. The way it works for AEAD is a portion of this packet is simply going to be authenticated data, meaning we're just going to check the integrity of that portion. It'll be run through something like a hashing algorithm. Then the rest is going to be both authenticated and encrypted, but they're both going to happen at the exact same time. The way it works is the digest ends up being built into the encryption sequence such that it's happening throughout the encry encryption process instead of there being two separate steps like it was before. The benefit to this is that you no longer have to worry about which one you're going to do first, whether you're going to do encryption or whether you're going to do integrity. This removes the consideration for Mac then encrypt or encrypt then Mac. Recall that TLS.2 did Mac then encrypt. We did hashing first and then encryption. Well, it turns out that that choice to do Mac first and encryption ended up causing a bunch of security vulnerabilities in the world of TLS prior. A better choice would have been to do encryption than MAC, which is what IPsec does. But a better choice than both of these is to use an AEAD cipher that actually does the encryption and integrity at the exact same time, which is why you no longer have to consider which you're doing first and which you're doing second. So that is the rundown on AEAD ciphers. 
and note that they were introduced in TLS 1.2. But in TLS 1.3, every one of these ciphers is an AEAD cipher, which means every TLS 1.3 session is going to include this better way of doing integrity and confidentiality with these AEAD ciphers. So that is the fourth change that we're going to step through in this lesson, which brings us to the fifth change. The fifth change is this one. All TLS 1.3 sessions are going to include forward secrecy. And so to unpack the context of this, we have to first define forward secrecy. Now we talked about forward secrecy back in module five, and again, a little bit in module six. I gave you a simplified definition of this. Once encrypted, always encrypted. The idea there is that the material you used to generate the secret session keys, which actually encrypt all the data, is built from purely ephemeral values. Ephemeral meaning temporary, meaning once you've built those keys, those ephemeral temporary values go away. They're not saved, they're not hard-coded, and there are new values every new session. If those initial values go away, that means there's no way to possibly recreate the same session keys. The only way would be via brute force. And if you're using session keys of sufficient size, that, that is infeasible. That is the benefit of forward secrecy. In a practical sense, what it means is that if a private key is compromised sometime in the future, you can't take that private key and go and decrypt everything that was sent in the past. Hence my simplified definition of once encrypted, always encrypted. That is forward secrecy. Now in TLS 1.2 and prior, forward secrecy was provided with any key exchange protocol that ended with an E, meaning these two right here. And recall that one of the things that TLS 1.3 does is it gets rid of insecure protocols, which means on this list, all of these protocols are no longer supported in TLS 1.3, which means the only remaining protocols both include that E, and therefore all key exchanges in TLS 1.3 provide forward secrecy. Now this does create some implications for where you can decrypt TLS traffic if you need to for compliance or security purposes, but we'll have a dedicated lesson talking about that later in this course. For now, just keep in mind that every TLS 1.3 session is going to provide forward secrecy. And that is a big win insofar as security. So that was the fifth change that we're gonna go through in this lesson, which now brings us to the sixth, and the sixth is that TLS.3 removes the possibility of doing custom Diffie-Hellman groups. Well, to understand this one, we have to first really define what a Diffie-Hellman group is. Recall, back in Module 2, we did cryptography, and specifically, we went through this illustration of Alice and Bob doing the Diffie-Hellman math together. If any of this is unfamiliar to you, I'd recommend going back to Module 2 in the cryptography module and taking a look at the Diffie-Hellman lesson. What I want to draw your attention to here is these two numbers over here. Before Alice and Bob could do Diffie-Hellman with each other, they had to first start by agreeing upon two numbers, a prime number and a generator. For our example, we use 6 and 13. This starting point is what's known as a Diffie-Hellman group, and every Diffie-Hellman calculation has to start with a mutually agreed starting point, or Diffie-Hellman group. In traditional Diffie-Hellman, which is the Diffie-Hellman we did a second ago with Bob and Alice, the starting point or the Diffie-Hellman group includes a prime number and a generator. That's for these versions of Diffie-Hellman. In elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, these versions of Diffie-Hellman, the Diffie-Hellman group or the starting point is a specific curve and a starting coordinate. Okay, but where do these Diffie-Hellman groups actually come from? Well, they're actually created via various standards. Traditional Diffie-Hellman groups are specified in these two RFCs, among others. Traditional Diffie-Hellman is sometimes referred to as finite field Diffie-Hellman or Diffie-Hellman with real numbers. That's compared to elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, which the starting point, the groups are defined via these various standards, among others. The point of all this is that there are industry-recognized Diffie-Hellman groups, starting points to do the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Well, TLS 1.2 and prior, also supported proposing custom Diffie-Hellman groups. Now, that sounds like it actually could be more secure. You could use a Diffie-Hellman key exchange with a starting point, a prime and a generator that have never been used before, which sounds like a huge win for security. But the issue is that doing cryptography is actually very, very hard. And picking a valid prime number and generator that doesn't end up opening up back doors that you didn't account for or know about is actually very difficult. 
So what TLS.3 did is said, well, listen, we're going to let the professionals that actually are responsible for creating these standards, we're going to trust them that they've done the good enough job of creating secure groups. And we're not going to expect a client and a server to establish a custom group on the fly. So TLS.3 simplifies ciphers by getting rid of custom Diffie-Hellman groups and requiring any Diffie-Hellman key exchange that is done to use a starting point that has been vetted by industry experts and professionals. So that is the sixth change that TLS.3 brings about. And that actually wraps up all the changes that I wanted to talk through in this lesson. The main takeaways from this lessoning are understanding the six differences that TLS.3 brings about as they relate to cipher suites. At this point, you should be able to step through each of these six items and identify which ones of these increase the simplicity of TLS.3 or increase the security of TLS.3 or both. In the next lesson, we're going to continue talking about the differences with TLS.3. We'll be talking about the differences that relate to the TLS handshake. But that's it for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed that lesson, then you'll also enjoy the full course that it came from, Practical TLS. It's a deep dive into SSL and TLS, taught methodically and intentionally, full of easy illustrations and in the simplest way possible. You'll get to learn cryptography, certificates, private keys, the handshake, OpenSSL, and everything you need to become an SSL expert. To learn more, check out pracnet.net slash TLS, and if you need more convincing that this is the best TLS training course, then check out the other free lesson previews on YouTube. Thank you and have a great day.